All right, we're live again. Cheers. Welcome to Happy Hour. It's a PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists like you from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories in the world of physical therapy. I'm Jimmy McKay. I'm your host, broadcasting live from the Arius Medical Studios, also known as My Bedroom. Welcome. Uh, find them at ariusmedical.com. It's A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Uh, leaders in travel physical therapy, if you are uh, just graduating, need a place to uh, to go do that thing that you've been studying for years and years to do, why not travel about the country? So travel PT, A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Great show for you tonight. Reed Handlery and Stacey Fritz from the University of South Carolina are here. We're going to talk about strength and how much you know about it, how much we should know about it. We're going we're gonna to study it. We're talking research, too. Uh, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google, uh, Google Podcasts, and we're now video casting on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, at PT Pinecast on the socials. That's where they are. Uh, questions, comments during the show, feel free to interrupt. That's what we're talking about. Uh, drop those questions and comments below. We want to hear from you. Uh, let us know where you're listening from as well. We had some people from across the pond. We always want to say cheers. We had some people from Europe and some South American uh, viewers and listeners uh, last couple of weeks. So that's pretty cool. Or you could even text me. I'm willing to throw my own phone number on the screen. That's my phone number. People are like, ah, it's like a Google number. It's just, it's just gonna. I'm, th- nope, that's that's the number. So test that out. Call my call my bluff. Uh, let us know questions or comments, however you want to get them in here. Uh, that's what we want to do. So let's uh, let's bring our guests in the studio from University of South Carolina. Reed Handlery and Stacy Fritz are here. <sighs> <sighs> Guys, I would say welcome to the show, but I have to be uh, a good podcast host and say welcome back to the show because you guys right. have been in the program before. It's been a, it's been a minute, is what, is what the kids say today. Stacy, you were on a while back, correct? You said, yeah, it's uh, it has been a minute, but uh, I've, I've joined Jimmy uh, at least once before, if not a, a few times uh, uh, from the distance or from behind the scenes. Yeah, and then we did the live show at University of South Carolina because we used to remember when we used to meet in person. We used to hang out with people we never met, and we used to shake and hands and stuff like that. Been it's been a minute. It's been a minute. We'll get there. All right. First question. We always like to get the first question out of the way. The hardest question of the entire episode. What do you drink? That's the question. Stacy, you want to go first? I have a Pinot Noir, Russian River Valley. So Welcome. I know we're t- I know we're talking strength, but I just ran in South Carolina, ninety five degrees. Yeah. I'm going. I'm, I'm with water today. <laughs> Hydrate. I had the same pint glass. That recess brew. Yes, you pint. do. That's right. I have that one. Uh, I, I went to Beer World today, so I like to find weird stuff. And this one's actually local. I'm living in the Hudson Valley, New York, right now. This one's from Poughkeepsie Millhouse Brewing. It's called the Grocery Getter. I have no idea what it means, but it's a tropical IPA. So cheers to you guys. Water is fine. You gotta hydrate before you can dehydrate. Uh, first round brought to you by our friends at Owens Recovery Science. We're talking strength. Owens Recovery Science. Those guys know uh, about strength. OwensRecoveryScience.com. A single source for PTs looking for uh, certification and personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. So check them out. They have their own podcast, too. If you want to get deep into BFR and strength, Owens Recovery Science Podcast. I have no idea where they came up with that name. Um, so last time we met, Reed, were you were you doing your PhD then? You weren't doing it then, right? I know, I know it's, it seems like so long and, and we joke that my mom, every time I talk to my mom, she says, you know, how much longer do you have? And she says it's, it always gets extended. Yeah. I've really only been doing it for about three years, but I should finish this December and then go find a job. So we're at the tail end of it. But yes, I was pursuing it. All right. And then Stacy, are, are, how are you? So we're talking about research, really. So Rita reached out and was like, hey, research and, um, you know, if you could share the link or whatever. And I was like, well, let's talk about it. Let's let's share the link. Absolutely. Too. And we're going to drop that in the comments, too, because we like to say everything's evidence-based. And you're trying to test something. You have a, an idea that you're trying to question. And then, Stacey, how are you involved in this whole this whole situation? So uh, at the University of South Carolina, our DPD students do research projects. And, and it's really to encourage them. We think as a doctoring profession that our students should be able to ask and answer a, a research question, a, some kind of clinically relevant question. And uh, I am Reed's PhD mentor. And as a PhD student in our program, he has the opportunity uh, to oversee some of the DPT student projects with my help. And so he came to me with this idea and uh, got three DPT students on board. Yeah. And uh, he said, all right, what do you think about this? I said, you know what? This is not my strength. 
no pun intended. Uh, but uh, if you'll take the lead, I'll, I'll support you and help you out where I can. So here I find myself supporting him and helping him out where I can. All right. Well, let's start. Let's start from the start here. Strength is important. I mean, it sounds like, well, duh, if you're a PT student, a PT, or, or even someone who knows around PT, or, or because this is going to test, we're looking at other professions, not just physical therapy, correct? So strength right. is important. Um, sounds like a gimme. It feels like a gimme one foot putt, right, Reed? But strength is important. W w where's your head go there? Absolutely. So we know that there's there's so much evidence to support it as a modality. Honestly, I think it's second to aerobic training as far as evidence to promote health and well-being. You always hear about the, the physical activity guidelines, the recommendations, but you normally hear that aerobic guideline. And then as a side note, it's like, oh, yeah, you should also strength train a little bit, too. Um, so we wanted to dive more into that. We know it's not just for athletes. So a lot of times people might associate you know, barbell lifts, squats and stuff like that with athletes. That is not the case. We know it works for clinical populations, low back pain, fibromyalgia name the population and it's probably beneficial for it. So that's what we wanted to examine a little bit further. All right. So when you hear, when you hear that, Stacey, for like from a re research perspective, like you're saying this isn't my jam, but research is your jam. <laughs> that is my jam. So um, I think the important thing is that we know as PTs, like Therex is a thing we go to. The literature says like 41% of services provided by PT are Therex. But we, we also know that we're not great at dosing it appropriately. We're really good at underdosing it. And in certain populations, like Jared, people uh, older age or people with neurological disability, we're really good at underdosing it. And that's where it comes in a little bit more to my jam is, is saying, okay, how do we really know if we're doing the right thing? And maybe we start with knowledge. Yeah. We talk about underdosing. Whenever I hear that phrase, I think of Dale Avers. She had a white paper a number of years ago and she said, you know, uh, underdosing can amount to malpractice. If you're un if you're not giving someone skilled services, but charging for skilled services and underdosing is doing that. And that was specifically for older adults, but this is for anybody, right? Yeah. It's yep, like absolutely. going to the dentist and getting like a quarter of your mouth cleaned, right? Yeah. yeah. You can't do that. You can't charge for the entire mouth. You only do the top right hand corner. Um, so now what are you trying to question, Reed? So now that you, you've, you've decided the thing you're going to look into further, how do you start to further narrow down that question in a funnel? Absolutely. So the, the students did a really nice job as far as the lit review. So seeing what's out there as far as we already know strength's important. So that's been proven. We don't want to prove that again. Um, but we don't know um, is what specifically as PTs and then other professions as well that we are trained on as far as strength. So everyone, I think, has a Therex class, at least one course. That probably varies across curriculums. I know when I had taken Therex, you sprinkle a little bit of strength training, but the concept of a barbell or a kettlebell or anything, honestly, over 10 pounds just didn't happen. And we weren't yeah. exposed to that. Um, and as an exercise science background, that was that was OK. I already knew that stuff. But, you know, coming in as a history major, if you're not um, if you're not used to that stuff, then you maybe didn't ever get exposed to it, which I think is a shame. And I don't think people are going to go out and continue to practice that. Yeah, like if you're a radio DJ coming through PT school the first time, you're like, well, some of the stuff, yeah, it's just, it's the first exposure to it. But also is how much. So I actually took the uh, the survey, and we've got the link. I don't expect you guys to type it on there if you're watching, but you can check it out in the comments below and give that a click. Um, so you're really trying to figure out how much education. We're saying PTs know that strength is important, right? There's our gimme. But now you're saying, well, how much education did you get into which aspects and how much how much do we as a collective? Now you're trying to you're trying to measure a bigger we than just one person in terms of how much strength training in PT education. You're doing this as a survey. We want people to click in that link below and take that survey so we can get a really, really big, um, a really big sample to, to figure out what actually is is known. But you're also looking to compare PT knowledge to knowledge outside of our profession as well. Absolutely. So we know strength is, is it's not just owned by PTs. It's, it's a universal thing. And I think the concept came from you read on bl Hopier blogs all the time how PTs suck at, at dosing, that we don't know how to touch a barbell. We don't know how to lift things that are, are heavy. Um, we just do, you know, TheraBand stuff, um, which is a time and a place for. So I wanted to and we wanted to prove that. Is that actually true? Well, how do we compare against uh, strength coaches or personal trainers? So, um, you know, exercise is a very universal thing. So uh, multiple people are going to be prescribing it. So we just want to see how that compared. So here, that's what we come to. We come to this. There's your title of your survey, which is strength training attitudes, behaviors and knowledge in current and future exercise professionals. So going broad, this doesn't say physical therapy. You're saying exercise professionals. And when, when you were starting to say that, Reed, 
um, in terms of you know PTs and the attitude of the 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 um, the the overall kind of cliche about PTs, we like to. There's one we like to tout, which is anatomical knowledge. There was a study that came out that showed like orthopedic surgeons, and boom, PTs right behind. We're like, yeah, boom, 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 cool, own that. But you were you're starting the you're starting this and saying I'm going to look into what is the exercise uh, knowledge in our profession. So so talk about this. Love the fact that you got the word attitude in a uh, in a professional survey. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we wanted to test. We didn't just want to test knowledge. Obviously, we demographics. We want to know um, you know how many years of experience are you a, a certified strength coach as well? Are you a PT and an AT or that combination? So what? How does that play into what you actually know and how you view strength training? Obviously, if you work in, a, in an acute care environment, your views on strength training and learn and teaching deadlifts may be different than someone who's in the outpatient realm. Um, so we wanted to cast a wide net as far as current and future exercise professionals because we want students involved too because they're the ones who are in, in it right now learning it, hopefully. Um, and so that's where that all came from. And then going back to you said the, the musculoskeletal study, that's actually where the, uh, the concept of this came from. I said, that's awesome. We, we are the movement experts. We always say that. Let's, let's prove it. We should know at least as much as the next professional on strength training. And you, and you're and you're asking you're you're encouraging um, people from outside of our profession to uh, to take this. We 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 jumped into this. I don't know how long ago because I mean I graduated in 2016, but it was this push for evidence based. That started a long time ago, and we're saying we'll put it out there. Let, let's measure this. If we're going to say something about us as a profession, um, let's put it out there. Let's measure it. If it's not true and we don't like it, let's fix it instead of hiding from it. And I think this is a, a good step in that. Yeah, and I think that's going to be important because we're, we're looking at PTs and PT students along with other professions and their students. So are the students receiving the knowledge or are people gaining it more in the clinic? Is there a difference between students and, and professionals? And I think that'll help us as well from my end, from the educational side on do we need to hit it harder or different? Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? Let's do some predictions, right? I mean, you, you set something like this up. Are you allowed to do that? Is that like, you know, saying the birthday wish out loud or I don't know the rules? Well, we've peeked at the data a little bit. So we have uh, some ideas from the first little group, uh, but we thought that PTs would have a strong knowledge uh, in this area. But I'm not sure, Reed, did you have an idea about the other professions? No. So the developing the survey and it was all developed by pts and then it was sent out to at's strength coaches as well because we didn't want to just make it a pt thing sure but um that we used kind of the boards format where it's based on a textbook which there's pros and cons behind that but we wanted something um to base it on off of so we used a, a typical uh, fair x book partly and then also the strength and conditioning kind of handbook as well so Hypothesis, yeah, I'm. You know, we're hoping that PTs out, outshine, or at least shine as bright as everyone else. Um, but there really was no direct hypothesis. Just we don't know. Like I said, the lit review didn't really show us much. We we have no idea. So we're we're learning a lot from this, and we have um, almost almost thirteen hundred responses thus wow. far. So it's it's real positive thus far. Well, thirteen hundred one. I took it this morning because I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to get in there, and I will tell people as a teaser. There's a there's a funny question. I'm not gonna tell you what there the is. One. I'm not gonna tell you what the right answer is to the funny question, but there's a funny. Question. I got I got flack about that from some people. They said you should it it, it delegitimizes it. I said no, no it, it makes it awesome. I've had that one. I've had that one time when someone was like, "You can't mix alcohol and physical therapy conversation." I'm like, "Have you been to a conference? Try to separate them." Um, now there's a crappy way to do it, and your funny question was funny. Like, I'm going to be honest, we've been there and I want people to be like, I want to know what the funny question is. Um, but this is a survey um, in terms of, you know, attitudes and be and well, attitudes, beliefs a little bit and experience, but also it was a little bit of a quiz. Yeah. So that's where the knowledge component comes in. So we want to know, do you think strength is important? How do you prescribe it? Are you comfortable prescribing it? How do you feel that other people in your profession prescribe it? And then, you know, get into some, some knowledge questions. Um, which it's it's completely anonymous. So even if you bomb it, you're, no one's gonna know. Um, no, so that's completely fine. You can guess. That's that's absolutely fine. It's take it like the boards exam. Right? You're not gonna <laughs> leave some blank. You're gonna answer right. them all, even if you don't know them. Correct. And by the way, if anybody's studying right now, do not leave any blank. Take a shot at it because it doesn't hurt you. Um, but you went straight guideline questions. I mean, these things sounded. Um, they are testing. This is not a. Tr these are not tricky questions. These are very very testing direct questions. For knowledge yeah we didn't want to get into the nuances of um how to teach someone how to squat there's there's too much gray in there so it's it's pretty 
pretty concrete and pretty what we think or what when we developed the survey pretty straight up concepts because we um that's where we that's where we needed to start maybe later on we get into some nuanced stuff but uh, as of right now first step keep it simple yeah, i like that all right we're gonna take some questions from the audience is that okay oh stacy go ahead i was just saying i really like the behaviors part because it asks about your own behaviors in strength training and exercise and i think that that may play into how you how we practice yeah I think, I think you're a hundred percent right. I mean, uh, uh, I've, I've, I remember thinking back to my PT school, uh, class and just the, the varied backgrounds as Reed was talking about in the beginning of, uh, of the episode, which is where did everybody come from? You know, what's your background? If that's the only class or classes, I don't know how many, sem- one, of the, one of the first questions was how many semesters of, or how long is your, is your, you know, uh, strengthening or therex uh, education in your program? And I, you're probably out of 1,300. You're probably already seeing varied results on that. Absolutely. Uh, let's hit some questions from the uh, from the audience. Well, first of all, someone named Casey is uh, giving a thumbs up. I've no <laughs> idea that is not related to the show at all. Um, but uh, do you think having strength and uh, a conditioning certification like the CSCS, which I heard a lot, I've never heard of it before I went to PT school. But once I got in there, everybody was kind of like, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna quick take this on a break. Uh, you know, I'm gonna study for this for a couple months, and I'm gonna really." hammer on this for a few weeks. I'm going to get my CSCS. Uh, question from uh, Bridget Nolan. Do you think a CSCS improves a PT's ability to dose Therex more than just your PT education? I mean, that's really kind of what you're trying to figure out, right? So yeah, we should we should be able to kind of answer that. We can compare PTs who do not have their strength and conditioning certification to those who do. And as I was a former CSCS, so I thought I was going to be a strength coach prior to entering PT school. Job job outlook said it, it, you should go a different route. It's it's hard to get into that realm. Um, so I actually was let it, my CSCS look. go ahead. This was it. Job outlook or wife that said uh, you need to go a different route. They were they were joined together um, as far as that. But yeah, absolutely. so I, I let that lapse. And a lot of people, I think the knowledge that you get studying for that exam, it, it really teaches you a lot about programming. And people will say it's just for athletes, but I think there's a tremendous amount of carryover as far as exercise prescription and giving you ideas about periodization, when to load, um, how to load. Um, form of a lot of exercise as well. So I think the knowledge gain studying for that is very, very valuable. I don't, unless your clinic requires it, sometimes, you know, a lot of people have CSCS now, um, sometimes clinics might require it. But I think if you don't need it, then do, you don't necessarily need just the letters behind your name. I think that's just a little addition, but that varies where you're at. Yeah. Um, how, if you were to teach, if you were to teach someone a class, right, if you were to take the, the, the textbook that everybody gets for the CSCS and you were to teach that in a class, how long would that take? Would that be a semester less? As far as far as the content in the survey, you mean? Yeah, and then to be able to effectively, you know, not just pass the test because no one wants to take the <laughs> class to just pass the test, but like to to get enough information to be able to effectively implement it. I and mean, that's a semester, right? Because I feel like Therex is a class. I feel like CSCS. If you have a program with an elective, that'd be a great elective. Absolutely. I, I had that in my undergrad as well. It was basically a, a class prep for that because it's not just the, the knowledge, right? It's, right? it's how does that relate to the practice? How do you, you know, coaching something and, and knowing how to verbalize it is a lot different. So, Two different things, yeah. Um, and we're movement experts. So, but I think the content in this survey, honestly, I could, you know, I could and probably have done in a lecture because it's just the what I consider the basics. Um, but then beyond that, I mean, if it were my, if it were up to me, and we had, you know, unlimited credit hours and tuition and all that stuff was just non-existent, we'd have a, an aerobic class and then a strength training class, and then maybe we'll throw in something else there. But I'm very biased in those two things. I think that's that's what we do as PT. It's a big part of what we do. So I think you can't get enough experience in training with that. Stacy, what do you think? I agree. I think uh, I think we also underdose in education the importance of therex. I think uh, we leave it out and and. Some of that might be because everyone says it's hard to teach. Uh, I think Reed would argue that he's very good at teaching it. And I would, I would, well, I would at least say he's very good at teaching it. I'm not sure he would. Um, but it's so important. It's so much of what we do. I think it needs to be in there. And it's not just one checkbooks on the, in the accreditation. You know, right. it's not, you, you just got to keep moving through it and, and make sure you have it. And that it's not just applied to orthopedic patients. That's one of the biggest problems. It yeah. matters for pediatric patients. It matters for neuro diagnoses. Everyone has to have uh, strength training. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I learned that from from two ends of the spectrum. I was a pediatric physical therapist uh, a little bit after I graduated from uh, from PT school, and I remember having my mentor Amy O'Malley would say, "You, you got to just sometimes some of these kids who are going to be in PT for life, 
your jobs sometimes make them sweaty, like make it fun and then make it difficult. So make them sweaty, make them work. And that's going to help them long term. And then I work with Jerry. I work with Fox with geriatric patients like same thing. Don't underdose. Yeah. And I think that's where we may be able to sh shine a little bit more compared to the other professions because we have so much education in other diagnoses, not just orthopedic issues or healthy adults. We're able to really work with different populations and know the underlying causes, the red flags, the contraindications, those type of things, and apply strength training appropriately to those populations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like this is, this comes into um, everybody's uh, discussion and I'm actually talking to uh, some students from Lynchburg college, uh, excuse me, Lynchburg University in about a week and a half. And one of them was like, how do you separate yourself from other professions? And how do you, how do you market yourself? And who the S words, how do you sell yourself? Um, and one of them in, you know, you, you wouldn't think twice this argument has comes up a lot of this, this, this setup, it comes up a lot, which is people don't think twice about paying a hundred bucks an hour for a personal trainer, but people will say, I don't know my PT, like, why would I pay for that? This is a way to, what I like to say, improve the value proposition right? We're going to now improve our strength and conditioning background to be really, really, really good at that. And by the way, our education is only going to enhance and back and, 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 and improve that. It gets me excited. Interesting. Uh, interesting you said that, Jimmy. I was actually, I was running around the track the other day. It was also very hot. And a, a girl uh, had come within six feet of me and then she stopped there. But then she <laughs> said, she's like, I'm trained. Are you a trainer? I, I apparently I was running fast enough to think uh, she thought I was in shape nice. or something. And I said, you know, I paused for a second. I go, no, I'm a physical therapist. She goes, oh, but are you a trainer? I said, no, I'm a physical therapist. And she's like, oh, I was like, well, what do you, what do you, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm trying to train for this FBI test. So she, there was a disconnect between a physical therapist can't help me do that. I was like, oh no, no, that's, that's bad. And that's, uh, that's some of the public view. It's, it's, we don't, we don't do, uh, we don't, we don't master that we're not masters of exercise. So um, I did provide, I did provide some um, education, which was nice. Um, and I hooked her up with a PT to help her out with what she was going for. Yeah. And I think APJ is really right now trying to push that a little bit more and saying, Hey, we are the experts, but I think some of the problem is us, right? We haven't been out there. We've been not treating appropriately with strength training or we'll see from the, from the research. Right. But, but I think the public perception might have some truth behind it. Yeah. If, if you're in an outpatient orthopedic clinic, right? Let's say you're a patient and we, we've been in these clinics before, right? Big room. And I like those big rooms where everybody can kind of see what everybody else is doing. And you're watching someone, you know, doing kind of short art quads for a little bit. And you're like, well, that doesn't look, even if you have no idea what they're in for, right? Because we're not discussing other people's history in, 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 uh, in other people's uh, uh, earshot. You're saying that doesn't look skilled at all, right? But if you get someone who honestly needs to strengthen their legs and you put a, you make them hold a barbell and they don't look even better when they look like they've never held a barbell before the patient. I mean, even better put, show them how to hold a barbell. Trainers are doing it right. Why can't we, why aren't we? Yeah. And it's amazing as you see the different clinics out there that don't have barbells or don't have yeah. a kettlebell or don't have a weight over five pounds. I won't, I will not say, who it was with, but one of my clinical rotations was with a very large physical therapy practice. In terms of large, I mean number of locations. And the heaviest thing in the clinic was 10 pounds. 10. 10 pounds. And I remember I remember working with an older adult patient, and she says, why, why would I lift the heaviest thing in the clinic? And I was in my head, I was like, well, you're damn right. We should probably have some heavier stuff. And she said, but I don't need to lift anything. And I was like, well, a gallon of milk, seven and three quarters pounds or something like that. I'm like, so 10 really isn't a lot over that. I'm like, do you want to be able to lift a gallon of milk or like, and when I put it in that perspective, she was like, Oh, is it? So that really was, that was a fail. And I don't blame the public perception on that when That's what you're looking at as a consumer. Why would I pay more for that? It doesn't look better. Ashley, Absolutely. The, the progress, how do you progressively overload the lower extremities with, with 10 pounds? I was in a similar clinic and I, I bought my own little set of kettlebells. Cause I was like, I need to, we need to do something about this. So yeah, I remember having a legitimately had one patient who was a runner, but this was the closest clinic. We were the, we were the closest opportunity for this person to get better. And I literally have hit, I had him lifting a stack of chairs cause it was, the, I was like, the chairs are really heavy. I'm like, put them all together. Let's squat some chairs. And my CI was like, I don't know if that's safe. I was like, is it safe for us to not have him lift anything? 
I, I, I'm weighing, I'm doing the pros and cons. I'm like, listen, yeah. if they fall, drop them. Just don't worry about the chairs. <laughs> some heavy stuff. When you look at the, uh, the comment here, Ashley Jones saying in our summer therapy class, she was surprised to learn how many of my classmates didn't have knowledge and or experience in strength and conditioning. This, I mean, this, this is proof of concept for your, for your survey here, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, we, don't require, yeah, we don't require it as a prerequisite coming into PT programs. And I think the, the class is so, so valuable as well. It's um, because some people who aren't currently, you know, maybe they're not exercisers and we know the benefits of exercise, just teaching them how to do things like squatting and, and beneficial things. That's, that's important too, for the own personal health of the provider. You should, yeah. in my opinion, be following the guideline. You should be yeah. aim, at least aiming for it. You should be, you know, trying to excel. Different story. I was at a wedding about a year ago and it was like the rehearsal dinner so it was like a smaller right venue and a, a woman there found out i was a physical therapist and she'd had a, a knee replacement and she was saying she was she did pt but didn't work and i was like oh my gosh i'm so sorry and i play i was the long play it was a slow play right i wasn't going to defend physical therapy i was going to ask i was like oh my gosh i'm so sorry it didn't work for you what about that fail it's like they were trying to get me to do squats and i was like oh my gosh why were they doing that and she's like i don't know i don't need to squat so what can you do to my knee can you like well, she was trying to get me to rub her? We were at a rehearsal dinner at a wedding, a very nice place, by the way. And she's like, What can you do to my knee to make it feel better? And I was like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know the intricacies of your of your of your situation, but it sounds like the PT was trying to get you to strengthen and do you know st squats really. Um, I don't know because I don't know this PT, but the goal sounded like strengthening. And she's like, But when am I gonna need to squat? She she wouldn't leave me alone. And I was looking ahead and I'm like, I'm going to be talking to you for the next 45 minutes. I'm like, I can really give you some stuff. And I could, I gave her a few opportunities to let's change the subject. And I said, do you like going to the bathroom alone? And she's like, what do you mean? Like, when, when you need to go to the bathroom, do you want someone to go with you? And she's like, well, no. And I was like, great. Getting on and off of a commode is a squat. squat. So that's the, probably the most basic, but the reason you're going to see you need to do a squat every, hopefully, hopefully every single day and that literally shut her up the look on her face but the funniest part was the look at her husband's face is like yeah if you didn't shut her up she was going to keep going so that's how i defended pt there we need context right our patients need context and that's what it gives them right if, if we're lifting heavy things or teaching them to deadlift why and explain that why to what it means to their functional life right. you know, we're still focusing on function and strength is function yeah i think that's it right strength is function and that's, that's what I was trying to do in that situation where I was like, listen, I'm going to put this in context because, yeah, I, I, I'm getting it. I don't, you're not going to go to the gym and you're not going to try to max deadlift. So I get it. But like, do you want to be strong? Then you need to sit up and stand, you know, stand up and sit down. And I need to put it in context uh, for her. Um, advice, uh, Reed Stacy, for professionals to take back ownership of being movement specialists. Because let's not, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But if the research is showing that there is improvement, what's the next step? Stacey, you want to start? <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll start by saying I'm not sure we have to be complete ownership. I think we can share it. Like, I think more professions need to because we have to have people to hand things off to also. Right. We know that, that PG dollars are mostly reimbursement based and there needs to be a continuum of care. So I think we need, instead of taking ownership, we need to say, hey, we can help prescribe and we can help guide and we can work with the other professions to make sure there is continued care after the acute event or con and continued care through significant chronic events. Take, for example, people with stroke with chronic disability, right? They can't, they only have so many visits, especially when they're on Medicare and limited. You know, how do, where do we hand them off? Where do we go next? And are we making sure we're handing them off to the right people? I think that's yes. well said. Yes. I like that. Yes. Like it's three yeses right there. Uh, when you hear that question on the screen right there, what do you think, Reed? Um, so I completely agree with Stacy, and I also think that you know we're not always the the one provider. So if it's not in your wheelhouse, you could care less about deadlifts or squats. But that's what your patient needs, and they need that extra continuum of care. Strength coaches, you know, send it to that next person. Send them down the line. Um, Ideally, you'd, you know, you'd be a role model for your patients and you'd have a, a little bit of background of knowing how to do that. But if it's not in your wheelhouse, that's, that's okay. And if you have no interest in learning that, um, another way is just continuing education. So there's plenty of stuff out there. The, the best option, in my opinion, and it's free, is to learn yourself, kind of explore movement yourself if you're not used to some of these movements. I think that's the way to do it. Um, yeah. But then there's plenty of continuing it out there as well if you want to yeah. 
become more of an expert. We also refer out within the PT field, right? I'm not going to see someone for women's health issues. I'm going to refer out to another PT. If if I have someone that needs different strength training expertise than I have, I'm going to refer them to Reed. Well, he's the trainer on the track. He's the guy moving. Well, that's right. <laughs> I like it. Um, so when uh, when people take this survey, and again, the the link to take this, and I would I would encourage anybody like just go and be honest and take this. The the more information we have, uh, the better we can we can extrapolate, decide where to go next. Um, what's the next step once you guys are are done with this, and when is it done? What's the next step after that? Yeah, so we're looking to probably an eight week window. So we're probably week three ish in there. So probably by the time fall semester start for some programs, we'll wrap it up, and then we're submitting a. If there is a CSM in, in Orlando, um, we, we're submitting an abstract for that. So some preliminary results will be there. Um, and then probably, you know, trying to push a manuscript out, get the actual evidence out there by the end of this year. Yeah. Like, and I, you know, I think it's, this is a good time to give a shout out to the DPT students that have really run this project that reads some inter- and that's uh, Lauren, Tavi, and Emma. And they've really uh, done a nice job putting this survey together, doing multiple practices of it. And, and really making sure it works. So yeah, yay to them. And uh, they are on a timeline for graduation. So that's going to limit our, our window as well. That's awesome. Um, we got some more questions coming in. This one, completely anonymous. Do you guys think that patients with neurologic diagnoses are being underdosed as far as strength training? I mean, this kind of goes along with what Stacy alluded to. And you picked two populations, right? You could have easily added neuro, but you picked geriatric and pediatric neurologic. Like a lot of times we like we almost skip what we know. We're like, Hey, this person in front of me, they're medically stable, right? They're medically stable right now. And sometimes we still underdose. I feel like I answered that question. I didn't just ask it. I feel like I answered. It. <laughs> so we have a, we have a, as a colleague who she says that um, people with um, chronic spinal cord injury or chronic stroke at that point, it's, it's kind of orthopedic, right? You're, you're, you're not necessarily treating the, uh, the functional deficits. I mean, you're still working on some of that stuff, but you know, why not strength? I, I think there's a, the ortho neuro, it should be completely blended, uh, especially as far as aerobic training or strength training. We all have hearts, we all have lungs, we all have muscles, and they're going to work in, in similar fashions. So Absolutely. I don't know. We, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know if they're being underdosed, but there was one study that looked at, uh, it was called like counting repetitions and it was an outpatient and it was people with stroke and that there were the number of repetitions was, was, was abysmal. It was like a hundred repetitions in 45 minutes or something of, of okay. pretty non-functional movements. Uh, and I was, someone needs to do that study in other settings as well, because it's like, I can't, I, I don't think they reported weight, but who knows what the weight was. It was probably a hundred reps of, of, a yeah. TheraBand resistance, which there is a time and a place for it. Don't get me wrong. Right. Yeah. I don't even think it was that many. I think those were just the gate steps that reached a hundred, but like the upper extremity reps were in the lower single digits and, and, we're just we're underdosing on a lot of levels, whether it be repetition, uh, strength training. And, you know, I don't think we actually know research wise if we're underdosing neuro, but I think we know that we're underdosing them. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, when was the last time you had your stroke patient, you know, do multiple squats or deadlifts because that's what they need to be able to do to move. Yeah. I mean, it was the one thing that I, I still remember. I remember what my professor looked like when she said it. She was like, here's the thing. You need lots and lots of reps with a patient with a neurologic sore. I was like, how many? And she's like thousands. And then we just had Nick Housley on the show last week, who is, is a physical therapist, uh, PhD in neuroscience, uh, had a traumatic brain injury himself. And now is working on a device that can actually like the device doesn't get tired. And if you gamify the device, that's what they were talking about with modus Nova gamify the device. Because if you just said do this a thousand times a week, like I would, I would just, I would just roll my, I would do zero. I wouldn't even do a hundred. You know what I mean? If it's like a thousand, if I'm never going to get there, I'm not going to do it. But he's like, we made it a game. We made it a golf game. We made it an airplane game. It's like, all right, cool. If the game's fun, you got a chance. But we know this. This is what we know from research is you got to have a lot of reps. And if we're underdosing, no good. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we're expecting our, our patients with neurological disorder to do lots of reps. And we're not strength training ourselves, you know, and if, if you have someone that has a healthy body and still has obstacles to, to physical activity, think about adding a stroke on there and worrying about having another stroke while you're lifting or falling down or all the things that we may not have to worry about uh, as able-bodied to, to be able to get out there and strength train. So it's important to give them that confidence and, and to be confident as a PT delivering it. Yeah. If you know someone needs more because of a because of an injury or because of an uh, because of an issue, 
I just, that's where I'm just like, think of every reason that you throw out of why you can't work out. And then that person has that plus getting to the gym, finding someone, maybe they can't drive themselves, getting to wherever they need to do to do the thing that they need to do. They have more reasons. And that's why I love sharing those freaking videos on Twitter of someone with a, with, with a, deficiency and for the podcast audience i'm using the air quotes here it's not and they're just like i'm just crushing it and like what's your that's why I'm like what's your excuse absolutely and i think it's it's really appropriate with uh with patients that are recovering from covid we're going to have patients that have been hospitalized and, and in bed for a long time and it's not just about the disease and it's not going to be just about the disease it's going to be about recovery and i and that's going to be really important with strength training and aerobic training coming back in is making sure we're hitting this new population. Right. I hope nobody, um, nobody experience is watching this says get has to experience COVID firsthand. I could not get tested, but let's just say I was sick for a month. That's all I'll say. I can't say I had COVID, but I'm a 40 year old male who does Ironman triathlons. And I took a thousand steps in seven days, seven days. And how long did it take me to be able to walk my brother's dog around the block? Like two weeks, like I could walk, but like to the point where I was like, I don't like, I feel winded. And that was a quarter mile. Yeah. Like these, these individuals are like, we said this before I work, I'm working with the centennial steering committee for the APTA to throw the year long party for the APTA. So that's why I'm like, fingers crossed for CSM, but if it's not safe, we, we shouldn't do it. Um, but <laughs> Our profession like rose out of a pan of, of, of a giant epidemic, right? The polio epidemic. This is where our profession came from. This is a great moment, I think, for us. If if we cannot, if we can make sure we get this out of our way, don't underdose. These people are going to need you to make them work. Absolutely. I'm excited. Um, a question about curriculum, Stacey. Maybe you can handle this just because you work with the the the, the, the PT program. Uh, addressing DPT cur uh, curriculum. We talked about this before. I kind of threw that hypothetical out. Like, how long would it take to uh, uh, to teach a class on a CSCS or something like that? Do I mean do even do places even have that? Can you get your CSCS in PT school? I guess we'll find out with your survey, which is why people should take it. So I know a lot of like uh, undergrad exercise science programs have classes to do that to do that within. I am sure there's some PT programs. Ours does not. I tell you what, it's more and more challenging with the expense yeah. of grad school, with the accreditation requirements, the, the addition of it to fit something like that in. Um, one thing we've been flirting with and is maybe making it an opportunity to do it outside of PT school. Um, so the students have kind of an avenue. But the, the challenge is we know how hard PT school is and how busy they are. Yeah. Um, so it is it is definitely difficult. And I'm going to back up my PT educators out there because and I. And this is, I have never educated, I've never been a, a, a professor at a PT program ever. Um, just saying, hey, take out a bunch of stuff and then put in other stuff. It's, it's more complicated. I mean, this is a layman saying, listen, trust me, the people that I know in education would do it or, or would do it. It's more complicated than that, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's everything can, to consider from student debt to length of classrooms to contact hours to faculty load. Uh, to accreditation. You know, it's all of those things that have to be considered uh, as you're planning the program. And uh, you know, my way around it a lot of times is I hire the people to teach that, that have great expertise. So Reed is a PhD student and I hired him as a TA to teach our TheraX course because he had great expertise and was able to bring a lot of, of that energy into the course. And so I think that's one way to deal with it. But if you don't have enough time, and with PT programs shortening and, and, and competing against each other, oh, we're only two years, we're only two and a half years. Uh, it's, it's hard to compete and make sure the students are getting everything we think they need. I mean, if you want to throw like the term slippery slope around, right? Like, so now, now people, you can, you can do the Walmart method, which is like, well, I'm going to compete on price. I'm just going to drop the price. I'm going to drop the price, right? But PT schools are not competing on time. So you're jamming all this information into two and a half years, two years, someone's going to come out with, you know, a uh, year and a half, right? There's 10 minute abs. Why not seven minute abs? Why not? Let's just go. Right. Finish it. Get, I want abs. Um, right. Well, it's too short. I think other people think they know what too short is. If, if you say, oh, well, one and a half, two years isn't too short. Well, is one year too short? I right. would argue it is to get all the, the knowledge. So, well, maybe we require more prerequisites. Yeah. All right. Know. Reed, this is your project, man. I'm going to give you full screen mode. Uh -oh. Full screen. You get 30 seconds to tell people why they should take the survey, why it's important they should take your survey to find out. 
and I'll bring it up on screen. Yeah, attitude, strength training, attitudes, behaviors, and knowledge in current, future exercise professionals. No pressure whatsoever. This is it right here. Okay, uh, hold on. We'll 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 get we'll get the timer on. Here we go. Thirty seconds and go. I'm wondering if I should start with a, a power analysis, but I don't think that'd be that would be time worthy. But all right, so we, we blew five seconds on that. But um, more more data points. It's going to give us more more questions to answer. So if you're someone, and I'll give you a sneak peek of the survey. A lot of people think that uh, many people think that strength training is is not being done well in physical therapists. Right. So let's let's prove let's disprove that or prove that one or the other um, by taking this survey remember there's no pressure it's anonymous so we don't know who you are we're not going to come find you or anything like that but let's move the profession forward let's move the needle let's figure out this first step what do we know and do we need to make improvements and then then we can make improvements after that so you nailed it you got it within within 30 seconds well done uh, the link to the study is going to be available in the show notes of the podcast episode, and it is right now in the comments below the uh, the Facebook uh, video. If you're if you're watching this thing online, uh, I'm excited that you guys are uh, that you guys are doing this. Uh, we got questions. Do you mind if we share the link to your survey on personal social media accounts? Probably not at all, right? Share Please it. Please share, 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 mm. and encourage others to share. The more responses we can get, if you're members of a group, you can post it in like your DPT program. Get other students to share it. Uh, we're going to go to the ortho section and get them to share it for us anywhere that you think you can reach other exercise professionals. Please do so. We've reached out to our colleagues and our, our means, but, uh, hand it out, get it out there. There it goes. All right. Uh, let's do three questions right now, Bridget. Can we do three questions? Let's have some fun with that. We'll do some fun stuff. Not that this wasn't fun. This is fun. We'll do three questions. Let's do it right now. <laughs> Three questions brought to you by our friends at Arius Medical Staffing. That's A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Leaders in travel PT. Uh, some people were like, wow, travel PT? I can't be doing that right now. It's like, well, there's a lot of areas in the country that need physical therapists who come there. You are essential. Go there. Uh, physical therapists, physical therapist assistants, uh, A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com is the website. Check them out right there. Uh, first question. I love three questions because it really gets... You, you can ask the same person the same three questions over and over again. They give you different answers. So first question, we'll go Stacy is a where question. You're in South Carolina, but if you can go anywhere in the 50 United States, and this is like, a, this is an important question now because we're all dying to go places. Uh, if you could go spend three months, right? A short-term travel assignment, where would you want to go in the U.S.? Look, and those of you at the University of Hawaii, if you want an adjunct instructor for a while, call me Hello. out. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I would do that. Hawaii, not bad. Reed, same question. Where? What's your where? Uh, let's see. It's summer. It's really hot. Let's go to Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> Time to do it. Reed, Reed's like literally like I'm dripping right now in South Carolina. I want to see a damn polar bear. Second question is a what question. This helped me helps me build my Netflix queue or my reading list. What's something you've watched, read, downloaded, anything that you think the audience could benefit from? Who's that for? Stacy? Both of you guys. Whoever goes. Take it. Stacy, you go first. I got to think. She's going to look right. it up. I was trying to look up the name of the book. I, I, I listened to it. I just, I just listened to a historical nonfiction book um, that really kind of tied together, together some of the racial injustice going on. And it was uh, very motivational. And if you let Reed answer first, I'll tell you. All right, you go. I think it was called The Invention of Wings. Yeah. So um, the book uh, called Missoula, I forget the author of it, but it looks at, um, it looks at, well, essentially, it looks at it looks at rape in the college systems, um, and basically what that looks like as far as uh, sexual abuse and all that kind of stuff. But it's a really eye-opening thing where you wouldn't you'd be like, "Wow, I didn't know that was actually happening um, in the U.S. like that." So it's an eye-opening thing, and it wow. gives you an insight into the judicial system a little bit, and then also the the system within colleges and how that operates. A lot of things being talked about that we literally would just be like, "Well, let's just not talk about that for a little while," and now we're like, "You know what? I don't know." I it feels like the gates are just like, you know what? Let's just talk about it. Uh, and, and, I think our, and I think our students want to in class. Yeah. They, you know, they're, we have a small group of students that set up a, a group to talk about some of the racial injustices going on and how to address those in the PT profession, which has been wonderful. Did you look, did you find what yours was? It is called the invention of wings by Sue Monk kid. It is a historical fiction, uh, but it's, but it still brings to light some of those, those issues. I like it. All right. Perfect. Thank you for sharing those. And the last question is we like to start and end with people is a who question. Who should the audience know more about? I like I I intentionally make that question very open ended. 
Reed, you go first on this one. Sure. Uh, there's a there's a, a PhD by the name of Chris Beard Beardsley, I believe it is. Um, so it, I believe his website Strength by Science, Strength and Conditioning, uh, Strength and Conditioning Research. I think it's dot com. Um, so that's a good place to go if you're looking at the sciencey aspect of it. Uh, get it well, get away from the kind of the more bro stuff where it, there's not evidence based. So, but it, it's a really nice job, and it still has some bro stuff too. Um, but it's science fact. So I like the bro. I like the bro bro science. Let's do a let's do a major on bro science. What do you want to go to school for? Bro science, Dad. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> he told me that. Well, he told me that, and I didn't know what bro science was. I had to look it up. Uh, <laughs> so my my answer to that is, I think you need to to watch out for Reed Handler. He's he's uh getting get ready to get his PhD. He's going to be teaching at a program somewhere, and he has the mind to ask those clinical based research questions. Like this one, right? Both based in strength. Like, what do we know as PTs and where are we going to go? So he has challenged me in a good way as my PhD student. And, and I'm excited to see where, the, where his career takes him. I'm excited. All right. So uh, again, I will hammer this again. The uh, The link for the survey is in the comments. It'll be in the uh, the show notes of the podcast as well. Uh, take it, please, by all means, share, share it, share a like. The more we figure out, take a really good look at ourselves, the more we can improve, hopefully, and then ultimately our patients benefit. Uh, so Stacey, uh, Reed, appreciate you guys stopping by for, for the episode. And let's do a follow-up. Let's set a date. Let's have another drink in a when it, whenever this is over. Let us know. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk results. I want to know results on this show. We can do that. Hopefully, hopefully it's CSM 2021, right? Fingers crossed. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Cheers to you guys. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks.